Greetings, everybody. This is Christopher Messina coming at you as ever from the last free state in America, Florida. Joining me today in the studio is Brian Denard, a former clandestine services officer who is going to share some glittering insights for us about the mess that is the south of south of our border today. Is that an accurate introduction, Brian? To, to, a, to a pretty good degree, yeah. It, uh, I think that the starting point that I'm going to get at is is uh, evolved into the chaos in Mexico today. <clears throat> and, of course, the chaos that was Colombia and is really tamped down to a dramatic uh, degree. Um, so let me, let me jump in. You said earlier that um, this is always, you know, uh, Civilians love to watch from a distance fun, dramatized stories on Netflix and elsewhere about gangsters. So there's plenty of material on Netflix and elsewhere about the cartels, about the drug, you know, about Pablo Escobar, all that. Uh, what is your commentary on on the relative validity of some of those versions that you've seen? Relative validity is probably uh, an incredible understatement. <laughs> Dramatized is dramatized and relative validity. Okay, well, if we combine those two and say relatively uh, uh, an extreme amount of bullshit and misleading and uh, skewed timelines and uh, how it all how it all transpired. Uh, Set us straight. <laughs> okay, so it, my uh, my first my I, I was I was never a. Uh, actively seeking to become part of the intelligence apparatus at all. Uh, I was, uh, I had just graduated with a master's in biology and had actually signed a contract to go to Australia on a research vessel to mm -hmm. study the box jellyfish. And ah, so the Irukandji was your, your initial passion. <laughs> <laughs> well, they told me that was going to be my passion. Uh, so uh, by a confluence of very strange, uh, very strange evolution of things, uh, which actually started by my owning a record store in Lubbock, which is even a longer story that we don't need to get into. I ended up in San Diego and uh, uh, was going to Scripps. And at the time that I got there, I, I had some friends from New Mexico Military Institute classmates. And uh, I was introduced to a gal uh, who was just more or less deserted by her boyfriend, father of her new daughter. He got busted uh, and was given a choice of going to jail or going home to Maine and going under house arrest. And he chose to remain rather than go to jail. Amazingly. <laughs> and uh, she was, uh, because that person who got caught was, he was one of the guys that was partners with the guy that we're going to talk about, Alberto Cecilia Falcone. And and the girl, I won't get in her, her name, let's just call her Mary, okay? Um, she's since deceased, but I don't want to bring her name into this because it's not fair to her because she was a non-participant in the drug deal. She was just good friends with Albert, with Alberto Cecilia Falcone, who was a very brilliant, brilliant thinker, uh, Cuban and highly educated. And uh, he liked having her around because she was not part of the drug fields and, and he could talk to her as a friend whereas he was surrounded by thuggery okay so um i just graduated and i was uh, i i needed to get away from uh academia so i i went up to julian uh outside of san diego and i was teaching uh as a t teacher's assistant which didn't cover my rent and so i drove down the back of the mountain to borrego and i was bartending every night except for Sunday nights to pay my rent just to stay away from just to get away from everything before I had to leave on the, the uh, boat uh, the research vessel and I was approached by a couple of people that uh, said hey it's your break could we talk to you and I'm scratching my head because by the time by four after four months small bar belly up bar you know everybody yep and I said sure and I sat down with them and they said hey you know uh uh, we got. We have a proposition for you, and I said, well, "What's that?" And they said, "Well, you know who Alberto Cecilia Falcone is." And I said, "Yeah, I know who he is." And they said, "Well, he's asking about you." And I said, 
asking me about. And you know this, how? That's about you. And I said, okay. And they said, well, this is a, a very unique opportunity. You know, uh, we'd like you to consider this. We know your background. We know you went to the Mexican military. We know your family, very conservative, uh, American, well, you know, very patriotic family, served in the World War II. Your brother is in Vietnam, blah, blah. And we believe that that you once we explain this to you, you'll you'll consider it. They said we'd like you to take uh, Alberto's uh, request to marry that he meet you because he was concerned about who is this guy that's that you're going out with? Is he trying to penetrate our organization? Who is he? Is he blah blah blah? Uh, working for the DEA or whatever. This is a great opportunity for you to get involved because we we know that he'll. He's, he's rapidly ascending to the top of, of the drug industry. And he needs executive help. He needs people that are intellectual around him and that he can relate to. And uh, you know, they didn't blow a lot of smoke up my ass. They said, look, this, is, this has the potential of being extremely dangerous. But at the same time, the, the attendant accoutrements will be very attractive. Money, fast sure. cars, women, drugs, rock and roll, blah, blah, blah. And uh, that's a good pitch. You know, whenever the government has tried to recruit me for something, they never mention the fast cars, the drugs and the hot women. It's they no. should they should really work on the on, on their pitch. Their marketing is terrible. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you wonder how many guys just fell into it with those straightforward black and white. Anyway, so um, my first reaction was, well, you know, you've, you've caught me at a, at, a, at a time where I'm supposed to be going to Australia. But uh, my concerns are that. You know, I'm from New Mexico, and this is 1972, and half of my friends in New Mexico were involved in selling, you know, a lid or a pound, or a few of them were flying small planes. And I, how could I be involved in getting this guy busted and my friends get a free pass? They said, no, 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 you don't understand. We're, we're not looking to bust anybody. We want, we want to follow the money because we believe this money is going to be used eventually to foment Marxist revolution. That's something, well, that's a good selling point for me. Okay. Whether it was true at that time. Uh, it was later no used to develop beach resorts in Acapulco. But whatever, Marxist revolution, overpriced margaritas, pick your poison. It, it, yeah, well. <laughs> power of the people. Power uh, of the people. Power of the so, margarita vendors. So uh, they, you know, they, 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 they told me that, that the doubt, the pit, one of the pitfalls is, look, the, pit, the, very, the, the very thing that made it so attractive is the same thing that was a pitfall. We don't have time to train you to do anything, but 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 <laughs> you're going in as you, and right. you can track you and and all the way back and and know that you're not with us. And uh, and they explained to me a few things that are you know spook stuff about uh, handlers and and. Uh, um, you know how I'd be contacted, etc. Cover his honesty. <laughs> so it eventually, very very quickly thereafter, uh, Mary said, "Hey, Albert wants to meet you, and uh, you know, come on down uh, this weekend. Can you take the weekend off?" And I said, "Well, yeah, sure, I can do." That. Um, so I went down to Tijuana to his. He had a he had a house that was up on the hill above what was the golf course. Uh, just north of the, the, the racetrack area. And uh, he had a, a, it wasn't a mansion, but it was, it was a very significant house that was round in front glass overlooking Tijuana and the golf course. And, and above in the backyard was a pool and a small house where his staff lived. And so I went and met Albert and he was sitting out by the pool. And when I came walking out, this was 1972. I came walking out and he sees me and he sets his book down. And I looked over at the book and he pointed at it and said, are you familiar with Solzhenitsyn? And I said, yeah, I've read all his books. And as a matter of fact, my favorite is Cancer Rule. We spent the rest of the afternoon talking about Solzhenitsyn and the Russian Revolution and the gulags and, and literally for the next four hours. He was a brilliant guy. And we had, you know, we, we connected because of, of one, the, the common, the common uh, uh, liking of Solzhenitsyn, following Solzhenitsyn and our 
uh, hatred of Marxists, etc. Now, I'll go back a bit. Uh, Alberto was uh, uh, an anti-Castristo in his, in his youth in Cuba, and uh, he was blowing up bridges and stuff to the CIA, and he and his family were extricated. And he was, uh, uh, his schooling was paid for by the CIA in Miami. He went to the University of Miami, got a degree, and then had some various problems, part of which was uh, he was charged with petty theft and sodomy. Albert was bisexual. Now, if you met him today, or if you'd met him in, you never would have thought he had any proclivities like that, because he was a man's man. And uh, also, I might have mentioned from the very start, it was like sitting with Ricky Ricardo, because he thought, hey, like, just like that, you know, hey, Lucy, you've got some splaining to do. Priceless. And, and, oh. so, <laughs> it, was, it was hard to keep a straight face at the, upon first meeting. It's thought, a shame we never got to make a movie about him with Desi Arnaz when he was alive. <laughs> right. just priceless. You know, he looked, he, he had a look like Desi, too. That's funny. But, um, okay, so now, now it's important for you to start, for people to start understanding. At this point in time, Albert, uh, and I know the history because Albert told me, Albert got his start. He got out of Miami and he went to Mexico and then into Central America. And I don't know the whole story about how he met Mercedes Coleman, but he did in Guatemala. And Mercedes Coleman now, if you Googled her, you wouldn't do anything about her. And very few people knew about her, but she was a, uh, let's call her the, the first Griselda Blanco. Okay. That's who she was to Guatemala and Central America. I and, I always love that possibly apocryphal quote from uh from uh Carlos when he said, you know, I've never been afraid of any man in my life except for a Griselda Blanco. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, get, we'll get to her later because I, I I had I had met her later. But so by by sheer circumstance in a, meeting Griselda. Uh, he became he he got intimately involved with the drug business. He started out small in Mexico, and his partners were two or three gringos who were submariners or submariners, I guess they called them, or submariners or British submariners or yeah. U.S. And that was the, that was the guy that ended up in Maine. Okay, so that that's the connection there. But he built it up quickly, and I'm not sure. I, I was never explained to me how this came evolved, but it might have been through. Uh, Mercedes. Two events that were similar. She introduced him to Gaston Santos. Gaston Santos, if you Google him, he was a world famous bullfighter, number one bullfighter in the world for a while. He fought from horseback, Portuguese style. He was the son of a very fabulously wealthy PRI big shot. And I mean one of the big shots that looks around the room and goes, you're going to be president. No, no, no. No, you are going to be president. And he became president. And they pulled the strings. And thus has it always been. So he met Gaston and got to be good friends with him. Now, at that time, Gaston was uh, not only a bullfighter, but he was also a movie star. And and because of his father's wealth, he was sent to Portugal to learn how to be a bullfighter instead of learning you know, how to run a business. He, but, See, that just any, wasn't on the job choice curriculum when I took those aptitude tests in New York. You know, nowhere was Portuguese bullfighter, and I feel gypped. Well, I would, I would. Maybe you should ask him about including that for henceforth. I think going forward, that sounds like a viable career path. Anyway, well, it is. Well, it, it, it has its pitfalls, though. Being gored in the groin is not one of the details. Details, yeah. but a, but a man's way to go. Anyway, I digress. <laughs> Well, you are familiar with the, the term. You know, we use the word, word bullfighter and bullfighting, and that is totally incorrect. Matador mm -hmm. is bringer of death. Okay. And mm -hmm. and his job is to is to present himself to the to 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 the bull to the bull and present his manhood. And think about a, a matador. How do they stand and they thrust their pelvis forward? They're right. showing the bull their balls and saying, you know. They're, they're challenging. Anyway, back to the story. Um, American culture has gotten so watered down and weak. <laughs> Nobody has any balls anymore. <laughs> so, um, so Albert got to know Gaston and became good friends with him. And this is this is the turning point of everything. And I, at this point in time, I had just come in. Uh, president Echeverria became president in 1970, 76. 
Gaston's father and Gaston brought Albert into the fold, into the fold and started talking to him and bringing in protection. Okay. At that point, they introduced him directly to President Echeverria. President Echeverria and his wife made the pact with the devil. And at that point was where the PRI and the drug trade became in, 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 entangled. Completely intertwined. And, and, well, not just yet. It, it took another year or two when uh, the, the next big turning point, and I'm jumping ahead and I'll go back, but I'll jump and ahead. The PRI for our gringo listeners is? That is the controlling political party of Mexico. Always has been until Pan, uh, when uh, I can't remember his name in the uh, early 90s, was elected. Uh, I'm sorry, 2000s, in the 2000s. Uh, but um, then, then the next seminal event was when uh, uh, President Echeverria introduced Jose Lopez, Jose Lopez Portillo to Alberto, uh, who was at that time Secretary of Minister of of ec economy, but he also oversaw the Policia Judicial Federal, the federal police. And at that point, the federal police became the protectors of the drug lords. And uh, to the degree that Albert had a card saying that he was a judge, and I had one that I carried that said I was part of the police, that was a get out of jail free card. Not only get out of jail free card, if a policeman pulled you over and saw that you had a weapon uh, and you showed him the card, the next question was, where are you going? I'm going over here. Follow me. And he turned on his side. Can we yes. get you there faster, sir? Much, much faster. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so at that time... See, I like to hear about governmental systems that work. It, yeah, it, it worked well. Very, very efficient. To this day. So at that point, um, Albert uh, was consolidating his power, but not just that. Now, let's back up a little. Um, up until Albert got uh, uh, really entrenched, the, there was no such thing as a cartel. There was the Mexican Mafia. They called themselves the Mexican Mafia. They owned the city of Culiacan, and in the bars there, they played the Mexican Mafia song. Literally, they had the Mexican Mafia song. And they were about Now, quick question. I can't sing it. Don't ask me to sing the song. From a Sicilian perspective, would, did anyone get angry about this cultural appropriation of Mexicans taking over a Sicilian term? I mean, current current f snowflakes would be very offended by this. Yeah, I, now, yeah, culture, it wasn't uh, uh, And there were no Sicilians, so... Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm offended. How dare they? How dare they? Exactly, well... It's like the, it's, it's like the Neapolitan cartel. If, I, if I'm offended, anyway, hey, we'll get back to <laughs> but consider the fact that they were well well armed on the city, and they, and if you wanted to dispute the cultural appropriation, you might have you yourself go take it up with them. It wouldn't be <laughs> taken up. It wouldn't be well, uh, you know, it yeah. wouldn't. Uh, It'd be a brief, brief heated it. dialogue. <laughs> yeah, that's heated, heated. Yeah. So uh, Albert, uh, at that time, Albert had a brilliant idea. Okay, um, the Mexican mafia was. Uh, heavily involved in the pot business, somewhat to the uh, somewhat to the heroin, somewhat to, uh, involved in heroin to the degree that they were, because Mexican brown heroin was competing with Chinese, which is there's no competition. So and and uh, and uh, Turkish. Uh, so Albert went to them and said, "Look, the gringos are flying down here, driving down here, and you're fronting them 100, 200, 300 pounds at twenty dollars a kilo. Give it all to me." I'll cross it and sell it for 60. I'll, I'll organize this whole thing. Right. Now, when he means organize, well, at that point, he was starting to work with the government, which meant that the government told the police and the military. And, and so it became this organization that was bad guys that are protected by the, the judicial police and somewhat to the last, somewhat to a smaller degree by the army. That came later. Uh, what you see in Netflix is totally it's total bullshit. Uh, and uh, during that period of time, so Albert's the next thing that Albert was brilliant at was this: his partners on the, in the on the American side. He said, "We're going to do this. We're going to call it the Sears and Roebuck 
Okay, so he would talk to his partners uh, whom, I, whom I knew. I didn't operate in the United States. That's not legal for CIA. Well, no. Uh, you wouldn't want to break any rules. So, uh, no, no, no. So, we, we had assist in bringing thousands of pounds of narcotics to the border, but crossing over will have to line too far. I get it. That makes yeah, yeah. I get you. Bright line morality. I'm with you. Line, yes, a line too far. You know, there's the red line. line so, line too so, far. I so, Al, uh, Albert had this, uh, this was a point. And he told his partners on the American side. Okay, so guys are coming to you and you're saying, you know, here's 10 pounds, you've got you know, uh, five, five days to pay me. Now, there wasn't any violence in those days. It was all, hey, peace, love, brother, you know, that kind of stuff, and, and patchouli oil and grateful bit. So Albert said, look, okay, so you have customers that buy 20 pounds from you. Yeah. Give them 100. What do you mean, give them? Give them 100. You mind? Why not? You're extending them credit on product anyway. What's the difference? And, and tell them, you know, when they say, well, "How long do I have?" To say, "When you come back, when you come back and pay me for the full hundred, I'll give you two. You come back and pay me for the two hundred, I'll give you four hundred. So, in a course of about a year and a half, Albert had quadrupled. He was dominating the pot business in in the United States. Now, this is before uh, Galardo started really growing real pot. So in today in today's words, he was running an alternative credit fund. Yeah, okay. See, but I'm not I'm not I'm not on the financial side. Just, there. There that was what he was doing. It was okay. an alternative credit fund with a commodity intermediary. It's very clever. <laughs> so consequently, uh the business started burgeoning. Albert had uh paid off to the degree that was avail able customer border agents and was crossing uh the ones that weren't paid off were unaware that the two gas tankers the piggyback down gas tankers you know the big tank and pulling another right. tank right were were fake uh there was this much gas at the top and the rest down below was 10 tons of pot he was right. crossing those every on a weekly basis now at that at, at that point uh and i'll start talking about um The uh, at at that point, I was um, I, I got to I got to know Albert very well. I got to be very good friends with him. And and to be honest with you, he was a very likable guy. Uh, the ideas that are in the movies and, and and in print, there's numerous. If you Google him, it talks about how he was psychotic and murdered people at the drop of a hat, and he had fabulous palaces and yachts and. and and big giant parties. None of that's true. None of that's true. Uh, he lived a very private life. Uh, the biggest party we were ever, there was a couple of incidents, but at his house, I never saw more than about four people that we had, four or five people where we had dinner at, at his big table that would see 12. It was basically a, a narco Warren Buffett. Yeah, I guess. He Living was, a simple life, running an empire. He, he, he did. He had a pretty simple life. Uh, one of the only things that was true in narco Mexico it showed this big party where there was hundreds of people, which is absolutely nonsense. Uh, there was a big, giant, uh, white, uh, uh, great name with black spots that walked through. That was Skipper. That was true. And Skipper was... <laughs> that's, that's the detail they got right. The massive the one, great the one detail. The one detail. And, <laughs> and I, as I raised Skipper's daughter, uh, Daphne, it was a gift to me by Albert. And she was my dog for 12 years before she died. And uh, so all of these, but I got to know him quite well. And, and he was, a, he ex, his expectations of the people that he respected were a perfect example. He said, uh, well, they're right. Uh, 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 we're going to play the back end for money. And I said, I don't know how to play back end. Oh, well, we have to fret the back end. He says, here Read this book, and he hands me backgammon for blood. He says, "And tomorrow we'll we'll play backgammon for blood." Tomorrow we play backgammon. Tomorrow, tomorrow. tomorrow. Get ready. Said, well, I said, "Well, I, I'll read the book." But this is when I was first there. It was like the second day. I said, "Well, that's uh, that's great. I'll read the book, but I can't play it for money. I don't have." Goes, oh no, no, you're on salary. Now. You're making eight hundred dollars a week. And you know, in 1972, eight hundred dollars a week. That was yeah. There you go. Like, oh, okay. Good. Yeah, that sounds good to me. And uh, so 
the the idea that he had these wild parties was nonsense. The idea that he was some sort of psychopath is totally ridiculous. He was a very nice, he was a very pleasant guy to be around. He was a, he was a lot of fun. Okay, so um, now so that set that set the, the tone for oh how the cartels acted. It was not a cartel at that time. In these in these movies, this Netflix stuff, I see uh, this word plaza. Uh, each one of them had a plaza. I, I'd never heard that term at all. Uh, in the in this Netflix thing, it shows Alberto. It, uh, his plaza was Tijuana, which is okay. He he ran Tijuana, and I'll explain to you uh, an incident that um, is very is very symbolic of of how this had evolved to the point where this is 1973. Now I've been with him for a year. And we went to watch Gaston's by at uh, Rosarito uh, at the bullfighter at the, at the arena. Mm. And we were in the governor's box with the governor of Baja California, the mayor of Tijuana, who was one of the Hank brothers, the two, two, one of the, two of the most powerful men in, in Mexico. His brother, Jorge, was the mayor of Mexico City. And they were extremely powerful. So we had the mayor of Tijuana, the governor of Baja California, the police chief of of uh, Tijuana and the head of the of the judicial police for Baja California, me and Albert, and we were watching uh, the, the bullfight. But at the same time, we were snorting coke and smoking pot and taking shots to the degree that when they brought in the uh, food for us all, we were so coked out and blown away and stoned out of our minds and drunk that we couldn't eat and weren't even sure we were watching a bullfight. But this was, these are these are the people that ran that part of the world. And then we're sitting, getting stoned with them. Watching Which explains them. an extreme amount about how poorly run that part of the world remains. <laughs> exactly. So at that time, um, Albert was, was truly untouchable because of his relationship with President Echeverria, his, his, his uh, uh, relationship with Jose Lopez Portillo, and uh, he he then evolved to moving to Mexico City because his position was going to be uh, elevated to I don't know how much much to a higher degree, but at that point he had been mentoring the Aureliano Felix brothers, who then took over Tijuana. I met them; those are two. Now those were psychopath murderers, truly. Uh, and um, turn this off. Sorry. Um, and at that time, he also met uh, Felix Galatoire, who later became the boss of boss of bosses. But at that point, at his meeting with him was because uh, Galardo was part of, part of the Felici uh, Judicial uh, down in the southern part of Mexico. So Albert moved to Mexico City. <laughs> in uh, 1974 and a half. And uh, I would go and visit him and I'll tell you, I'll, I'll, I'll branch out and tell you a very funny story about our friendship because we were we were friends, we were good friends. And I visited him and we had interesting times together. We, we, we would fly to San Felipe on his plane. He had a very interesting thing. One of his quirks was when he would pull into the parking lot of the airport in Tijuana and put his step out when his left foot hit or he wanted to see the right engine start on his on his King Air, and uh, and then we'd fly to to San Felipe and have a weekend of doing buggies and and shooting machine guns and shark hunting and just a blowout for, for three or four days and then back to work. He's got to blow um, some steam if he's got this much business. Yeah, I get yeah. it. I get it. He's got to relax. But Fair enough. I have to say, I, I have to say that that. Um, as opposed to some of the people in Colombia that I, I knew, uh, the people at the top didn't do drugs. You know, they'd, you'd snort coke once in a while and, 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 and smoke pot once in a while, but very rare, very rare. Uh, it's the way wanted, of good decision making. And they, they wanted a clear mind. And, and if they <laughs> found out, there was people that were eliminated because of drug use. Okay? If sure. Thought, as you filtered down, they didn't care because they had such a buffer between them. So, um, the, the, when he moved to Mexico City, I would go down and see him, 
And I'll tell you an interesting, funny story. Uh, I went down to see him one time, uh, and it was it had to do with uh, making sure of money delivery. And as we pulled in, he had a new house with, in, in Pedregal with a big yard, and we pulled in, and there was this turkey running around the yard. And I asked Albert, I said, what, what is this? And he says, oh, I did it right. He says, we are going to fatten him up and have a wonderful Thanksgiving. Oh, okay. So it was three months later that I went back uh, on a very similar trip. And I'm sitting in Albert's office. Albert, you know, we're talking, I'm on the side of the desk. And in comes the turkey and jumps up on the desk. <laughs> and I said, I thought this guy was supposed to be Thanksgiving feast last month. And he says, oh, I did it And he says, Skipper, and he have become blood, blood brothers. And he is a wonderful watchman. So... Yeah, turkeys are nuts. I was actually going to say that. Like you, you, you have not been chased by a bird until you've been chased by a turkey. <laughs> well, he says, he says it is a wonderful watchdog, and so we have postponed the execution. Brian, I would like you to meet the newest member of the family, Arturo the turkey. <laughs> that, that, that was that was Albert. It is sense of humor. You'll see even more. That's fabulous. Uh, so, Albert, Albert at that point had done everything we could to now I, i'll back up a, a year but first i want to tell you this um the well let, let, let me let me go ahead to go back up to 1974 there was an incident that albert caused albert to shut down uh, all the operations for eight months because there was a guy alberto, alberto Barrueta, that had um, um caused two two tankers to be uh captured Okay. Oh. And, oh. and and so for business. So everybody, you know, get out of town, lay low, shut down. And Albert said uh, he wanted me to go to. Uh, um, I'm trying to remember the. Uh, uh, oh, but yeah, Albert asked Al Albert asked me to go to Miami to meet uh, Juan Bayasnero, ba who was a Honduran that was a connection to Colombia. And that's where the connection started, okay? And he was with the Cali cartel, but I was in Miami with him uh, at Albert's request. And uh, at the same time, he introduced me to some, uh, some of the smugglers that were working for the Colombians. And they were, they were the children of mafiosos. They were actually mafia kids. Their, their uncle, one of them, Robert, I won't say his last name. His uncle was the, the heroin guy for New York, for the mob up in New York. And they were, they're dangerous guys, but wild and wacky guys, you know. And they hung out at the Muni Club. Now, if you've seen uh, Scarface, uh, as I'm sure you have, who hasn't? And you remember they used to hang out at the Babylon Club. Well, yep. the Muni Club, it was all a takeoff on the Muni Club. As a right. matter of fact, the whole crew uh, including uh, Oliver, what's his name? Brian Oliver. Yeah. Uh, what? No. What's the guy? The the movie maker. Anyway, all of them. The actors, Pacino and uh, Michelle Pfeiffer, and the whole crew. They stayed at the Muni Hotel. Right. And uh, 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 they, they to get in the rhythm. And that was that was. I was taken there by. Uh, Bicerros and one of the Italian kids, and I met Jorge Ochoa, the Arthur Club, who, by virtue of this, I ended up six months later in 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 uh, Colombia in in Medellin. Well, not really Medellin, over in Envigado, and vicariously I met Pablo Escobar. But at that time, I met him because he was running errands for his uncles, uh, Mario and Joaquin uh, Gradilla. Uh, who were too old, they were like 73, 74-year-old coquiteros, co coke guys. Yeah. And they were full-on cowboys. You know, big belt buckles, cowboy hats, riding riding their horses around, right down the street. They were yeah. they didn't like it. Quick, quick yeah. question. I, I have a strong feeling we're going to have to do this in serial rather than one shot. So here's, yeah. here's, a, here's a, a thought. So in the midst of all this, what okay, is the... Let me get to the end of what happened with Albert because this. Is All right. Okay. Okay. okay so, so keep in mind, Albert had Albert had done what was what he was supposed to do, 
uh, which he was blessed to do, which was organize. They organize it, put it together, get it ready. Uh, they had a big meeting with the president and President Echeverria and Jose Lucas Portillo and, and Gaston Santos' father and the people down south in Oaxaca and Zapoteca to build a railroad from that part of Mexico up to the frontier to transport pot. Period, paragraph, the government was going to build it. So everything was organized. And at that point, Albert was, at that point, you need to understand that the, the drug lords now are hunted men. Except, so they live in their towns and it's, a, it's surrounded by guys with AK 47s. And back then, Albert, I'd, when I, I'd go down, instead of going to Albert's house, I'd, I'd meet him over by the statue, you know, on the statue of the angel on Reforma. I'd, I'd meet him over there because he was at the dentist and we'd walk around, you know, talking and go to a restaurant and then go to his house. Well, Albert started dating Irma La Tigresa Serrano, who was like Marilyn Monroe. Okay, she was a movie star of Mexico. She was a singer and a movie star, and she was beautiful, and she was Marilyn Monroe, not, uh, the, 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 was the Taylor of Mexico. Okay. Albert got two, there's pictures of him. If you Google it, this is like, okay, and you'll see a picture of him with Al, having dinner with Irma La Tigresa Serrano. So Albert, the, the, the American government, came to uh, the Mexican government and said, we'll pay you $3 million if you let us bust out. They said, yeah, okay. Because he was expendable at that point. And right. he, wasn't a, he wasn't a Mexican. So, they, so Albert got busted, tortured, and he, he got, to, this is important, he got tortured and he for three days, and he deserved three or two and a half, three days, and he decided that he was going to commit suicide rather than continue on and spill the beans and rat out the president and you know right. they probably would have killed him anyway and anyway so blood was leaking out under the door and they rushed him to the hospital and at that time at that time gaston and Irma had a full page ad in the paper saying if you see this man there's a you know a ten five thousand dollar us dollar reward Okay, and so when Albert was rushed to the hospital to save his life, they snuck him in the back door. But one of the nurses recognized him from the newspaper, called me to call. Gaston sent a private army down, boom, surrounded. But Albert was taken from there to Le Combere prison instead of wherever this under the location was, and put in prison in at, um, Le Combere, which is the Palacio Negro. And you can Google that. It's this old, old, old yeah. prison. It's that and he was there and uh lived in, in the wing where a bunch of big shots lived they had their own uh security and Albert had two cells one where he slept and one just for uh guests to come and sit and snort coke and smoke pot and have a drink and talk business <laughs> and uh when he when he was first arrested uh one of the one of the guys there wanted to suck up to Albert and made a painted a picture of a lion because Albert was a, a Leo. And Albert, with his sense of humor, took a box, painted it black, cut it so that it looked like a, the bars of a jail, and put it over the picture of the lion. <laughs> so upon, one time when I was there, I met, visited him there three times in, in Le Convery, in his cell. You go to their cells, you don't go to the way. Of... Right. And one time I was there and Albert gave me a list of phone numbers. He says, oh, my dear Ryan. He says, from now on, these are like you to be at these locations on these days for me to call you. And I said, well, Albert, I call the commandant's office and they go get you and you tell the commandant to beat it. And he talk, we talk business. And he goes, no, I'm planning on leaving in a few days. I'm <laughs> I've grown tired of the accommodations. <laughs> so, you're leaving. He goes, yes, uh, I'll tell you where you're standing. There's nothing to come I said, okay. And sure enough, five days later, he broke out of prison in a tunnel. And when the guards came to find him gone, Albert had opened the jail door on the picture of himself. <laughs> so at any rate, Albert was, uh, he escaped, but he was caught four days later because the commandant gave up the location under torture. And law. But that was the end of Albert. And did that from that day to this, I mean, I went and visited him several times because I was very close to his mother. Uh, I buy her house in La Jolla, and it was close to uh, his mother and his daughter, his sister and his dad. And uh, so that was the end of Albert. 
and and the whole transition went to the uh, uh, Felix Gallardo and and uh, those people that were that had that had been mentored by him, and everything was in place for them to move forward under the protection of the police, the policia judicial. Okay, so uh, he put it all in place, and was he was expendable at that point, right? Precisely because he was Cuban, and he was becoming an embarrassment because he was out in public doing things that you know, it was just too much. You see, we have a few minutes left. So that's that was uh, from that day to this, no one really knows much about him. I know more about him than just about anybody except Jesse Fink, who wrote the book Pure Narco. And uh, uh, well, I, I just want to ask a question though, because this is rather important. I, I'm, I'm curious about this. So. Anywhere in the course of all this, did your putative employer, which would be the American government, did anyone ever get the picture of like this is just like tilting at windmills? Like, why are we bothering? So long as Americans no, no, want to store cocaine, there's going to be a hierarchy in money, whether it's Alberto or whether it's you know Jason, doesn't really matter. You know, why are we doing all this? Did that ever okay. come up, or is that just yeah? The, no, the reason was was where is this money going? And it wasn't it was an embarrassment because I made two deliveries on this side of the border um, to one of the head DEA guys, and uh, which which after the bus put me in a fairly embarrassing, strange, dangerous position with that guy, mm -hmm. and that, that's another story for another day. But uh, we did we did uh, we did. I was I was I did provide enough information to show that that Albert wasn't directly involved in any money going to uh, um, anti-American interests vis-a-vis -vis political, not anti-American interests because of the flood of drugs. But two things: one, Albert was never whatever you read is untrue about his involvement in cocaine. He was just touching on the periphery of cocaine at the time that he was busted. Uh, maybe he had probably brought across maybe 20 or 30 kilos total, not a, not a flood. It was, you know, five here, 10 here, four here, five here, just to test and get it rolling. Okay. So, but the, we, we were, or did meet, there was another Griselda, not Griselda Blanco, but a Griselda in Mexico City who was head of the, of the communist party. And she lived in, uh, um, uh, Pedregal, not Pedregal, the other, the other fancy, she had this mansion with uh, Louis XIV furniture throughout. I mean, she lived the life of Riley and she was one of the ugliest old hags you've ever seen in your life. <laughs> but nonetheless, so so the concern uh, of, of money going to foment revolution was true to a smaller degree, much bigger. And I was, uh, I, that's a tale for another day because I became intimately and in not, yeah, I became fairly involved in, in the Colombian uh, uh, after Albert got busted, I was still connected through um, through Ballesteros to Jose, through Ochoa, who introduced me to those guys in Colombia and in Vigado, and I got to know Carlos later very well. We visited him at Norman Kay. Uh, you talk about an insane guy, but nonetheless, that led that led. It was it was almost like a Zelig type thing, or or. Forrest Gump. I was in these. Every time something would happen, where the where the where my handlers were like, "Well, okay, maybe we should get you out." It was like I'd be in a in a meeting that was like mind boggling. You were in a meeting with who? And then what? And in their minds, what was your role here? Right, because you, the as I understand, your initial contact was just this guy. This smart guy wanted to talk to someone who wasn't a thug and an idiot, and you happened to be. Dating somebody new, and that was an initial conversation. Well, you left out the part that I wasn't a thug and that I was extremely intelligent. Right. Well, but, that's the point. You wanted to find someone who wasn't a thug to talk to, and that's how you began all this. But yeah, like, but I the, yeah. As it evolved, you know, what was your role? Why were you there? What? Why did they think you were in these meetings? Oh, because I could. Because the the, the CIA became quite aware of the magnitude of what was being built. They didn't know at that point that that Echeverri was involved and that Jose that was. Tito was involved and gave our government leverage to the degree that they they knew and they now was it ever was it ever utilized publicly? No. Would the United States government admit that they knew this and know it to this day? No. Yeah. Well, for example, know, I don't mean the U.S. government. I mean the people those those Griselda and Carlos and Ochoa. What did they think you were there? Why were you there? What how? 
why were they why why in their minds is this gringo sitting here in this meeting why are you there well okay i helped i helped with the organizational aspect okay and i i had people on the other side so i had i had access to the people in the united states that were key to them i helped them down in down in in colombia albert asked me to to help make the connection so that the Colombians started use, utilizing what was built by Albert over here. And at the same time, when I was in Colombia, they knew that I knew the smugglers that were, were being involved. They knew I knew Barry Seal, but I mean, I knew him because of being in Miami at the time. And so my position was one of trust because, because of Albert. They knew who Alberto was. He was a legend throughout all the way up. Until so they just thought you were another person in the drug business. Yeah. Yeah, that had that had high standing. I'd sat I'd sat in meetings with sure. the president of Mexico. Again. And and that's a lot. People don't know this, but uh, Cancun and Cozumel were built by Echeverria and his wife with that money that they got. Mm. That's why they own most of it. But that, that I think is the biggest question that a lot of Americans think when they hear about any of this is that the the people in the drug trade knew they were dealing directly with the intelligence agents in the U.S., but they didn't know that. They were just dealing with this American who was in the drug trade. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. If, if they had known that, I, that my connection, I would have been dead. And that's why, that's why the hardest part for me was that my role, it, it, they made it very clear when I first went in, you know, you realize you can't tell your parents, oh, no, I work for the CIA. Right. People, are, people, you're going to lose your your... People are going to look down on you, and they're going to think you're a drug dealer. And that did happen because yeah. of the bust. When Albert got busted in '75, we all got busted. Now, I the reason I got out of it was because the first bust was because the the guy that snitched us out had me here and here and here, and I had a passport showing I wasn't even in the country. Right. So they had they had to they had to you know the evidence was there. They had to they didn't have anything on me. They had pictures of me with Albert. They had pictures of me with. This guy and that guy and this guy. And there were some big shots, you know, but it didn't so, amount to, to To wrap it up, because I think we want to revisit this because this is I think there's a lot more. But what's the main takeaway that American taxpayers should understand about, you know, historic the last but dozens of decades, however long we've been involved in this nonsense? What has the American taxpayer gotten for all the money that we have thrown at this at this problem, if anything? Okay. The, the, well, that that really comes more into play in volume two because I because I can verify unequivocally that the money that that was paid to the Cubans went directly to Daniel Ortega for the for the revolution in Nicaragua. Okay. So if you want to talk about the domino effect and and the the, the uh, you know our uh, our influence in Mexico and in the Caribbean and Central America. Uh, and and our fight against uh, the communist threat, it was directly paid for by drug money. Okay. Right. What have we gotten out of it? Well, I, I guess uh, covertly uh, leverage, leverage, which I don't believe has ever been applied to Mexico. I mean, right now you look at what's going on at the southern border, this invasion, and the Mexican right. gov president yesterday said to you, to the, yeah. the U.S. You know, you either do what I tell you to, or I will continue to let them come across. Well, we obviously we have leverage because of uh, that uh, El Chapo. Remember when he, when he, supposedly he, he gave an eight hundred million dollar bribe to the president? That wasn't oh, a yeah. bribe. That was his payment. That's that was his payment. Bribe. That was, that was, the, bribe that was the quarterly payment. <laughs> biannual, biannual payment. All right. And so, to the degree that we have leverage. We never used it to my knowledge, uh, but there there was vast evidence of the collusion between the government and and the growing uh, uh, drug trade in Mexico. I mean, my God, they were building a railroad right. to transport the pot from the Largo. So sort of uh, like a nineteen seventies Mexican build back better. There you go. <laughs> Except they, they, they almost built. Yeah, and and so it's a it's a tale that that. As I say, uh, my one of my biggest uh, pet peeves about all this was the, the uh, and which really got me wound up and started on you know, all this was watching Narcos Mexico, and that's a whole other thing. The last narc about Felix uh, 
Rodriguez, I wanted to address that at another time because that's very important. It's a total, complete lie about Phoenix, absolute, unequivocal lie, and I can prove it. But it, it just got my crank, you know, got me cranked up when I saw this, these, this representation of Albert is this, you know, uh, queen, you know, like, uh, and, and, uh, and how he's portrayed and these wild parties and murders and none of it's true and 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 how it started and 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 like i say it started out there was no such thing as it was, it was the mexican mafia and it evolved right. and how was the guy who did it i was there at the start you know, i mean it was it's 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 a remarkable tale but i was there i saw it and, and without albert it wouldn't it, it would not have been organized to the degree it was because the people that were involved in the business at that time were thugs they weren't any brilliant thinkers like Albert. Right. And believe me, none of those guys, those low-level thugs that were running the drug business, they would never would have sat down with Gaston's father and the president of Mexico. They wouldn't have gotten in the door. Albert did because he could sit and he could talk philosophical. He could talk about the economy. He could talk about all of these things in an intellectual way that, that, was, that was accepted by those people. Okay, was it a rationalization on their part? Sure, it was a rationalization. Oh, and money. Oh, you know, this, tons of it. And it wasn't money for the people. It was money for them personally. You know? So yeah. there was no altruism involved. I mean, they could pretend there was. But, you know, oh, yeah, well, we're going to build this uh, Riviera over in uh, Cancun and close for the people. Yeah. But, for the people. Yeah. 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 For the people, they can walk along the beach and they can look up at my gated mansions. For the people, yeah. well, they something to aspire to. You we're too could become president of Mexico and strike a deal with the drug gangs. It's a, it's all up to you. Yeah. <laughs> Horatio yeah. Alger, in well, London. that's fabulous. O'Brien, well, thank you so much. That is an excellent. That is an excellent intro to. Uh, oh God, I don't even know. Like it is such a colossal mess. You just. You, you look at, at, at the things that have snowballed from those days. Yes, it did. And the insanity of where we are, where now you've got, I mean, the the the, the, the Mexican gangs used to launder all their money through the resorts. That was fine. And part of the intelligence was if a single tourist gets harmed, you, you're killing the goose that lays the golden egg. That turned into Zeta's machine gunning rival, you know, resorts full of Americans and Europeans. Like craziness. Crazy. It wasn't like that in the 70s. It wasn't like that. I don't know. It, right. it sounds very it civilized. Patchouli and weed. Um, well, I, I thank you so much. That uh, we, all, we only had an hour, sadly, but we're going to pick this up again. Um, yeah. We'll put a couple of links below for anyone who's interested in digging in a little further. Uh, and it's, it's usual, as, as many Americans will know, to um, you know, thank people for their service, but I don't know if I got to thank someone who's driving around in fast cars and hanging out with the president of Mexico <laughs> at, at, at Matador events. I mean, I think it's like you got, you already got thanked brother. <laughs> yeah. I didn't get to keep any of the money. I didn't get to keep any of the money. I had to keep strict, strict books as to what I was, the, the pile of money that was in my yeah, But none of us get to keep the money. We go naked into the grave, right? <laughs> That's true. That's true. That's pretty good, though. But um, any final words of wisdom, or we'll 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 cut off chapter one here. We'll pick it up again. Pick it up again. I have no words of wisdom. It's, it's just just uh, watch your six. <laughs> That's that is that is good enough. Always. Well, yeah. thank you for that. Uh, and uh, you know, we'll have you back on again. Thanks for taking the time. And to hey. my usual, my normal listeners. Uh, I don't think I need to remind you to turn to the mainstream media who are lying to you and tune into messy times. <laughs>